My guest today is a medium who has achieved a BA and a Master's in Religion, Ethics and Philosophy. But does that kind of education make him an ideal candidate to become a world-class medium? Well, stay around and find out. This is the Spirited Talk podcast. Stories and conversations about connecting with your friends and loved ones in the spirit world. With over 20 years of study and practice as a medium, here's the host of the show, Trevor. My guest today is a medium who teaches and demonstrates throughout the world and is also a tutor at the world-famous Arthur Finlay College. His clinical approach to his mediumship, combined with his advanced education, is something he takes very seriously. My guest was born in the West Midlands of England and today is talking to me from his current home in Canada. His mentors have had an obvious impression on his personal mediumship and that is an aspect I hope we'll explore in today's interview. Since developing his mediumship over the last 15 years to the highest of standards, he now organises his own courses at the Arthur Finlay College and privately offering a real education into this work as well as the practical aspects. My guest believes that mediumship should be presented with a rational approach and not as something supernatural. I'm glad that he has found space in his heavy schedule to share some time with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Andy Bing, CSNU. And a very good day to you, Andy. It is lovely to see you and finally get to talk to you on Spirited Talk. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And and thank you for inviting me to partake in the interview. Oh, absolutely my pleasure. And there's one or two of my friends will be delighted when they hear that you're speaking because they they come back from the AFC, the Arthur Finlay College, and they go, I've just been with Andy. Oh, he's an amazing teacher. He's absolutely brilliant. Well, let's see if we can find that out today, if you don't mind. Can I just ask before we start, Andy, where are you actually talking to me from today? I'm actually living in Canada now. I I moved here um, on Christmas Eve last year. So a Brummie in Canada? Yeah, it's quite quite rare. I've I've met a couple of Brummies, a few people from Manchester. So there's there's a few of us here, but not not many. Well, do you know what? As we came to do this interview today, we're doing it on because of the time difference. And we're doing it here. It's four o'clock nearly in the UK at the moment. And I know that's morning time where you are. But when I walked out to this studio today to fire up the heaters, I thought, by heck it's cold out here it's really is cold it's got to be about 10 degrees or so in Wigan but to you I suppose that's a bit of a heat wave it is it's minus four here today oh god no we've had uh, we've had a foot of snow over the last few days so it's uh it's 10 degrees would be spring for us <laughs> really oh my goodness isn't it funny right Andy let's get on with this we're going to just spend a little bit of time and find out a little bit about your early years So could you briefly give me an outline of those early years, your family set up, whether you had brothers and sisters, etc.? Yeah, I lived in Bourneville where they make the Cadbury's chocolate. I lived there with my mum and dad and my sister. We've lived in the same house all of my life uh, with them. And a very normal family. You know, my dad worked at the time at Rover Cast, which is now, they don't make the cars anymore, but you circle with the factory. And my mum worked in the supermarket and... It was just a a very normal working class family. I feel that your father and your mother were very concerned about you getting an education. What brought that on? Why? Yeah, I I think my mum and dad have always really encouraged me to be the best that I can be. And, you know, I I think as a young guy, from a young boy, I I used to see my dad uh, working seven days a week overtime to to provide for us. And And it really instilled a work ethic from a very young age. And, you know, when I... Actually left school. I, I didn't go straight to university. I, I actually started as an accountant. I worked for one of the big four accounting companies. My mum and dad were quite disappointed, really, that I hadn't gone to university. I kind of realised quite early on that accounting wasn't for me, and then decided to go actually go to university to retrain and, and to do something that I really enjoyed. And I was very glad that I waited until I was 25 because I, I actually knew what I wanted to study when I, when I did go to university. But it, it's always been, you know, I've always had this intellectual curiosity about life and mom and dad always really have encouraged me to to follow that curiosity wherever it may lead and that's always been something that's given me not just the motivation but also the, the permission if you like to to try new things and to 
experience life to the fullest so it's always been really good i found out when i was researching you you were born in 1985 i was yeah and i had been married a year so technically i'm old enough to be your father and that really (laughs) really does upset me because i'm i kind of think well what questions do i ask from your generation because that's my children's generation what i mean give us an idea what music were you into i've always really loved 1950s r&b mod music from the 60s, jazz. I, I do listen to to modern music too. Growing up, I, I very much started with Bob Dylan and the Beatles and the Stones. And then rather than going forwards, I, I kind of went backwards. So Billie Holiday, Ray Charles, Johnny Cash, lots of old classics really is what I've always been involved in and and northern soul was always a big a big interest of mine uh, in, yep well I'm in the home of northern soul at the moment Wigan yeah Wigan Casino uh-huh. it's a legendary place have you been there and I've never been to Wigan it's one of the few places uh, that I haven't been to actually when I was in my kind of early 20s I, I used to go to sort of mod nights that there would be kind of all night northern soul parties so Wigan was always a place that I wanted to go to, but I always ended up in the Midlands or, or down in London where I was living at the time. So yeah, I never managed really to get over to, to see you. And there's been a bit of a revival in recent years with a bit of the Northern Soul coming back in. And there's certainly a big influence in some of the music today. Yeah, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't just the music. It was also the fashion. You know, I remember, you know, when I, not so much anymore, anymore, but again, in my early 20s, I used to go to all the secondhand stores and vintage shops. And I, I used to dress it in 1960s clothes, you know, it was, it was not it's not just the music it was the whole culture of the 60s i, I always really um was quite fascinated with and did you have a scooter i still do have a scooter i have a mobliette but it's green and white it's called percy and um i'm not sure if it's still working now because it's not been used for a couple of years because i've been i've been away but yeah definitely had a scooter there was me thinking you would be the quiet type the sort of introvert or uh, virtual sort that would stay at home and and swat but actually, you were a bit of a rebel out in the streets. I've always worked hard and, and played hard. You know, I, I enjoy going out. I enjoy having lots of having friends and uh, socialising. So I think, you know, life is for living. And I think sometimes you can, especially if you're interested in mediumship and spirituality, you can end up spending so much time talking to the so-called dead that you can forget the living. And I think it's important to get a balance between the two. Now, when I was doing some research on you, Andy, I found out that one of your grandmothers died when you were at the age of three. Yeah, my dad's mom, her name was Pansy. She passed away from a massive heart attack when I was uh, three years old. I don't really have many memories. I, I, in fact, I, I don't remember her. I was too young really to have those early memories. But yeah, she passed away in her sleep with a massive heart attack. It's always been a kind of a big pivotal moment in my life because I, I remember even from a very young age when I used to go and visit my grandfather, he lived in the same house all of his life. I always had this, was very aware of my grandmother when I was at the home. And I, I remember as a, as a young kid, I, I'd probably been seven or eight years of age, there was always a chair that was that used to be next to the uh, TV. And I used to sit on the couch opposite. And I used to talk to my nan in my head. And of course, I was a child. I'd, I didn't really think anything of it. But I asked my grandfather once, you know, who, whose chair was, was that chair over there? And he, he said, oh, it's, it was always your grandmother's chair. And I know now looking back, you know, I was I was having an awareness of, of her in that house. I mean, I, I wouldn't even go upstairs to my grandfather's house because I really had this strong experience of the presence of my grandmother. And I guess at that age, it was not scary, but it was quite disconcerting to have that awareness. And later on, did you learn what Claire that was? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from the experiences that, that I had, it was very much a Claire sentience. And, and of course, I, I really believe that the Claire cognizance is really when all the different aspects of your mediumship work together it comes as really a knowing. And, you know, I, I think it's difficult for me to say what exactly what sort of mediumistic phenomena that was, other than. It was definitely a spiritual experience of her and still continue to do so. And it wasn't just me having an experience with her. I mean, my mum and dad used to quite often hear my bed being rocked when I was a, when I was a young kid. Someone on the end, of, like it was on the end of my bed rocking me to sleep. And about, I think, you know, when I was in my teenage years, my mum went to a medium for a sitting and 
the medium said, you know, when you when your son was a young boy, you used to hear this rocking on your on the bed, and it was Pansy, who's my grandmother. So, you know, I, I think my grandmother took a really interest in me when I was a young boy, and, and still does today. So, at least one of your parents, then your mother in this case, had some knowing of there being an afterlife or a spiritual world. Yeah, religion was never really a big feature in our household. I was an Anglican uh, when I was a child, but we never really went to church maybe once a year for Christmas. I, I don't ever remember being going to church. But in the background, mediumship has always featured in my life. And my mum used to organise parties, private sitting parties for the family at the house. And a couple of times a year, she would have local mediums coming around to the home and giving sittings. Mediumship's followed me throughout my life, really. I remember uh, I was actually in Bournemouth when I was six years of age. And I remember this. We were, we were sitting having lunch on our family holiday and a woman just came out of nowhere and looked at me and said to my mom and dad he's got the gift and then walked off it was quite a strange experience at the time but looking back I've had spiritual experiences and kind of glimpses of mediumistic potential that was there within me in, in different ways all of that came to a zenith if you like when I was 18 and that's when I really began to find my mediumship and, and start to move into my what I would call my, my serious development then. Well, just to fill in that gap, was that about the time you went off to Sheffield to chase a relationship and a career? When I left school, I, I said I, I started with one of the big four accounting companies and I actually decided to move to Sheffield to start that work, to be with my girlfriend at the time. We actually started a relationship. I'd been seeing it since I was 16. My mum and dad used to let me go out into the bit into Birmingham City when I was 16 on the Saturday morning by myself with friends. So I, I used to say to them that I was going into the city for the day with friends and I used to catch the train up, up to Sheffield. And I did that for two years without getting caught, actually. So I was quite a lucky guy, really. And when the opportunity came then to, to move to Sheffield, I, I, I took that opportunity. After living in Sheffield for a few months, only a few months, I mean, we were both kids. We were both just 18. That relationship failed and that had a, a real knock-on effect to my whole life at the time that affected my work. I was just starting a new career and that became increasingly more difficult to maintain because I was going through depression and because I didn't go to university, my mum and dad had saved some money for over the years for, for my education. So they used that money to put a small deposit down on a studio apartment and I lost the house too. So I sort of lost everything at the time. My work was failing. My relationship had failed. The house didn't work out. You know, I was too proud to tell my mum and dad about what was going on. They hadn't really understood that I'd moved to Sheffield, not for a career, but for a relationship. So I kept it quite quiet about, you know, what I was going through. And of course, they, re they recognised there was something wrong, but they just put it down to homesickness or, you know, settling into a new city. And I remember on, on the evenings... I used to just have this urge to walk. Nine to five was fine. I was at work. I, I was sort of distracting myself. But on the evenings was was very difficult. I was I was left to my own devices and my own thoughts. And I had this, this passion to to walk. So I used to walk around the city for hours. I'm not sure if I was in a way looking for for her and trying to find her because she she lived in the same city as I did. I'm not sure if I was looking for a new life, looking for inspiration, looking for God. I used just to walk, trying to find something, but I was just walking around aimlessly. And one evening, after a couple of months of doing that, I came across a small building just up the road from where I was living on a place called Eccleshall Road. And I saw people walking into this building. It had no signage, just a door, and I was intrigued. So I actually decided just to, to step in the door and there was a, an old guy sitting at a table and I said to him, what is this place? And he said, well, it's a, it's a Buddhist temple and uh, this evening it's our open meditation evening. So would you like to join us? So I accepted that. I started to learn how to meditate and over a few weeks, I, I started to substitute my daily walks for meditation practice and I was meditating an hour a day every day uh, Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sundays were quite difficult because I had the whole day, I had the full days free so I used to sit twice a day on Saturday and Sunday so I was doing nine hours of meditation a week you know I did that for a year over that period of time I really went to hell and back to be honest when I was sitting quietly 
I started to really get in touch with all my own emotions. And those emotions were not just about my situation in Sheffield. It, there were things that were coming to the surface from throughout my life. I actually suffered from a very prominent speech impediment. I had a, a stutter from a very young age. And it still affects me now, but I've learned to cover it up over with speech therapy and discipline. Lots of experiences of being bullied and people making fun of my speech impediment, of not feeling I've really got a voice. I had to deal with, deal with all of those things, as well as other trivial things that I didn't really think were making a big impact on my life, but they were there in the background. I had to get to know myself. And over that 12-month period, I went to the, the very depths of my soul and also to the, the very heights of myself. You know, it's about, I had to recognise what my positive qualities were and, and the value that I had as a person. And I also had to recognise the, the aspects that I hadn't quite dealt with that were difficult in my life and, and also looking at my weaknesses. And it was a roller coaster. But over that 12 months, I, I started to feel much more comfortable in my own skin. I remember it was one Saturday morning. I was in bed, nine o'clock in the morning. My mum rang me and informed me that my, my paternal grandfather had, had passed away. In that moment, I broke, I think, not just because of his passing, but it was the crescendo of all the things that had been going on over that last 12 months. I'd, I'd broken my arm a couple of months before that, which, and I was still going through that. So that was one thing. And then my grandfather passed away. It was the, the sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, really. I told my mum and dad what was going on, and I, they kind of immediately got me back to Birmingham. A few days after what that was going on, and after my grandfather, I was told my grandfather passed away. I woke up one morning with this knowingness, really, that I could communicate with the spirit world. And it wasn't a big revelation. It wasn't a big finger pointing down at me. But all of the experiences that I'd had leading up to that time, spiritual experiences, you know, becoming aware of my grandmother. There's another experience with my grandmother to do with finding roses which was a big thing in the family. There was my mum and dad hearing voices in, coming from our room when I was a kid and they'd go into the room and hear voices. And as soon as I opened the door, the voices would stop. All of these experiences that I've been told about and had remembered, they all began to make sense. I, I saw perspective that there was actually something there. And that really led me then to want to explore my own mediumship. So I did. I went back to Birmingham. I managed to get a transfer to the Birmingham office. And I did the same thing. I started to research about mediumship and found upon this, this term spiritualism, which I hadn't heard of before, and found the SNU, Spiritualist National Union, and looked up a local spiritualist church, which was around the corner in, in Kings Heath, Birmingham. I remember it was a Thursday evening. I just decided to go and have a look at the church just to find where it was and see what it was like, I'm not expecting it to be open or just wanted to see the building. Can I just take you a minute back to Sheffield and to those meditations? During that meditation, what battle was going on and how did that evolve or how did that come about? Was it you talking to yourself in your mind? No, I mean, with, with the meditation, this is what I was taught from the Buddhist tradition and subsequently re realised it's actually also what Purushis teach within their sitting in the power practice is the reason I, I did so much meditation was because I was teaching myself and creating a discipline within my mind to actually quiet my mind. Lots of people think that with meditation, you have to have a blank mind and it's impossible. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. What he was saying was, is that one of the conditions to exist is that we are conscious thinking animals. So it's impossible not to think. What we're actually trying to do within the beginning of our practice within the meditation is we're beginning to find this state of mind where we're not thinking about anything in particular, but we're aware of everything that's going on around us. So it's where we, we're, we're suppressing, quietening the mundane thoughts of our mind. And of course, that was very attractive to me at the time because I had a lot of thoughts going on. I was in a mess. So those meditation practices gave me peace. I was able to quiet my mind and really just experiencing my own power the power of my own soul. And what I found really in the meditation practice itself is that I wasn't really aware of anything. There's not a battle going on within a meditation practice. What the meditation practice was doing was it, it was bringing emotion to the surface. It was allowing me, as I was sitting in that power of my own soul, 
it was allowing those emotions to begin to, to pierce my conscious. Or it, or it was allowing you to drop your guards. Yeah, a bit of both. But uh, as I was sitting there, I would be aware of my, my own power. Sometimes I would be aware of emotion that would start to rise up within me within the meditation, but that was quite rare. Most of the time, I, I wasn't really consciously aware of anything other than that sense of that power of myself. What I then found was in my everyday life, so I might have been you know, washing up, probably not washing up, I don't do much washing up, but could be cooking, could be cleaning, could be sitting reading a book. Then these memories, these experiences started to come back. The meditation practice was allowing some of those suppressed emotions and experiences that I'd buried. It was allowing them to start to break the surface, to come to the surface. Those experiences don't necessarily break the surface during the practice itself, but the practice is what's bringing them to the surface. They can, they can break the surface at any moment within our life. And then what I taught myself to do, rather than acknowledging a memory, acknowledging an experience and go, okay, yeah, thinking about it and then forgetting about it. I used to then sit quietly when I had five minutes and I would start to relive those experiences again. I'd connect to the emotion of them and, re and not just think about them. I would allow myself to relive those moments and, and experience the emotion and how I felt within those moments and really what happened in those moments. And that then started to create a distance between me and the experience itself. It, it gave me an opportunity to release that emotion. I, I, sometimes I'd laugh, sometimes I'd cry, sometimes I'd be depressed, sometimes I'd be you know, static, all sorts of different emotions. It gave me a chance to release those emotions and, it, and especially in the more difficult parts of my life, by releasing that emotion all of a sudden it begins to have less power over you and when it has less power over you you can begin to see the experience for what it truly is and that gives you then space to begin to understand yourself and to really take account and understand what has happened in your life how it's affected you in a positive way how it may have hindered certain aspects of yourself what qualities and characteristics it's began to formulate within your own power it really helps you to start to build this open and honest relationship with yourself. And that's exactly the journey that I was going on do, during that time in shift. Do you think I would be fair in saying this took you from somebody that didn't like themselves to somebody accepting themselves? I think that the honest answer is that, and this is me being very honest with you, when I was a teenager, especially at secondary school, it was a very difficult time. You know, I didn't really have many friends one or two I was academic but I, I was also one of the you know I used to have my mom and dad used to let us have have house parties every few months so I was very academic but I also was very sociable and you know was had friends outside of school not many in school but lots of friends outside of school so I think when you're a kid especially a teenager people want to put you in a box you know, you're either sports kid, you're either the geek, you're either the rebel. And I guess I sort of had one foot in different camps. I was academic, like I said, but I could also have, a, have fun and, and socialise. You know, I had girlfriends when I was growing up through my teenage years. So, And I think people found that difficult to deal with. You have so many similarities to me and yet you managed to have girlfriends. I didn't manage that even. <laughs> so I was bullied quite a lot, really. From the age of 12 to 18 was, was a very difficult time. And Sheffield, of course, part of me that wanted to leave Birmingham was to leave behind all of that time at school. And then I kind of jumped from out of the pan into the fire. Sheffield was even worse than the schooling beforehand. So it wasn't a case that I didn't like myself. When I go through adversity, I just work harder. You know, I work harder to make myself overcome. And there's always been obstacles. And there's always been people that have take away and detract from what, what I'm trying to do, whether that was at school, academically, whether it was at university. Even the same, I can say the same happens mm. within mediumship. So all my life, I've always had that. But I've always had this inner strength to rise above and to continue and to, to try to achieve something that I feel I need to achieve for myself. I always valued that part of myself, but there was difficulty at, at that age about being accepted, accepted by groups of people. And to some degree, these things never completely go away. You know, that's always going to be part of my own insecurity as a person. That period within Sheffield was, it was about really accepting that I wasn't always accepted. 
and being okay with that and recognizing that that doesn't take away the value of who I am as a person, mm. as an individual, but also made me start to look at what am I doing in these dynamics that's causing that to happen to? How are these experiences that I've had growing up from age of 12 to 18? How is that now changing my behavior with groups of people? From the age of like 18 to, to now, especially between the age of 18 to 24, 25, it really made me look at myself but proactively engage with people. And from the age of 18 to 24, you know, I had Birmingham. I, I knew pretty much everybody in the city who was going out. You know, we used to, when we used to socialise, we'd go to different bars, especially for the sort of music that we were in true. I knew everyone and I got on with everyone. And it was a really good time for me to put that time. It was, this is the key about spirituality. It's not just about knowing who you are and about experiencing it and accepting it. It's about then going out into the world and, and acting upon it. Spirited Talk and the podcast playlist are free podcasts. If you would like to make a financial contribution to the project, please visit our patron page at spiritedtalkpodcast.com and Spirited Talk Podcast is all one word. Thank you. Hello, I'm Joanne Galloway from Carlisle in Cumbria in the UK. I'm a partner in Spirited Talk Podcast. I find it very inspiring, and I also listen to Spirited Talk podcasts when I'm doing my housework. Hello, my name's Neil Bradley, and I'm a spiritual medium. If there's one thing that Spirit Talk podcast has the ability to do, it's to shine a light across the globe. This is the Spirited Talk podcast. And welcome back to the second half. Well, we were about to carry on with the story, but Andy has to face Arthur's questions. Are you ready? I am. What number would you like between one and ten, Andy? I'll take number three. Number three? Here we go. Arthur, it's over to you. Here is your chosen question. Question three. If you had to come back to Earth after you pass, would you return as a man or a woman? <laughs> That's, um, wow. Uh, I've never thought about this before. I actually think I'd come back as a woman. I think it would be, uh, it would be, you know, my, my wife is always complaining about how difficult it is to be a woman. So I think it's only fair that I actually experience it myself. For just the, the, the political reasons rather than any other reason. Um, <laughs> I, I, I better not say that, really. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, dear, oh, dear. What a good question. Right, let's get back on to your story. Thank you for that. I know that you've got BA in philosophy. Now, did that come before you were able to question yourself or after? Because it sounds to me like you had an insight into finding something more about inner self. I went to university already as a working medium. I was already demonstrating and, and teaching. I was just doing my, my tutor training at the college when I began university in 2010. So this was very much before then. But I think really, and this is I think really important for, for people that are listening, and I mentioned this earlier on too, as a medium, it's very important, I think, that you lead as normal life as possible, that you actually enjoy people. And I think, this again, this is what it was all about at that time in my life. It was about me growing into my role as a medium. The medium has to show their vulnerability publicly. You have to be really comfortable with who you are, but, but you also have to learn how to interact with people. One of the differences between your mediumship and some mediums would be that you came into mediumship already armed with certain skills that only you and people that have been in your situation would have. For example, I was bullied at school. So I now, even now, I can tell when somebody is belittling me. And it can be the tiniest line, the tiniest word, but I recognise belittling very, very quickly. I recognise the bully in somebody very very quickly and that's a sensitive thing that's a sensitive thing that you brought into your mediumship without being aware of it what we've got to remember is that the mediumship is simply an expression of my own soul so all of the things that i've experienced from the first day i was, I was born till today that makes up my mediumship that changes the qualities of who i am every experience every thought every action changes the very quality and nature of me and that, of course, then affects the expression of my mediumship. What I've, I've come to understand now is that all these experiences that I have gone through all help to bring to the surface and bring forth that mediumistic potential that was there. But what that means, of course, this is the dichotomy. If your mediumship is made up of, of you, your, the aggregate of all your experience, which it is, it's a reflection of that experience because that's what changes the nature of you. 
those experiences do. It means that quite often, in my case, was very true. Let me just take a step back for a moment to explain this properly. I very much come from the school of thought that mediums are born, they're not made. Okay, And by that, what we're talking about is that at the moment of birth or conception, that greater power called the spirit endows the individual with certain talents and qualities. Those talents and qualities could be anything. The ballerina, the musician, the nurse, doctor, the accountant. Some people are born to be accountants. They just love it, right? We all have natural, in, innate qualities and talents that are there from the very moment that we're born. And some people might not agree with that, but let's take a look at Mozart, for instance. Mozart, at the age of three, not only could play the piano, but could write very rudimentary compositions. Now, it's impossible to be taught that in three years. What Mozart shows is that all of us have innate qualities, natural qualities. And in some people, those qualities can be very active and on the surface right from the first moment that they're born, which is why we have these childhood prodigies in, in all sorts of different expressions and, and in avenues. But for other people, those qualities, those natural talents and gifts are present, but are dormant or latent. They don't happen until later on in their life. And this is what we mean by mediums are born and not made. What we mean is now everyone can have an awareness of the spirit world. I accept that. But not everybody is going to have the potential to be able to develop that awareness, to be able to communicate publicly on behalf of the spirit world. Makes no sense. It's like me saying, if we say, well, no, every, everybody has the potential to be the best medium that could ever possibly be, then why don't we all have the potential to be the greatest ballerina? Or why don't we all have the potential to be the greatest concert pianist? Why don't we all have the potential to be the greatest snooker player? You know, if you look at Ronnie O'Sullivan, snooker player, I could play snooker, and I do play snooker. I play snooker three or four hours a day. I'm never going to be Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's got a natural flair, something that, yeah, an X factor, something that is intangible. But even when he picked up that snooker cue, he could play straight away, just play. And he did. He won tournaments at the age of eight. The same with Mozart. I look at a piano, I see a set of, a box and a set of keys. Mozart looked at the piano, saw music. He's got a natural quality of flair for it. It's the same with the medium. Everyone can have an awareness, like everybody can, everybody can play a frame of snooker. Everybody can play piano to some degree. Everybody can do a few ballet moves. We can all have an awareness of the spirit world, but there's going to be a few people in every generation, in the same in every other expression in life, who are going to have that, that extra thing, that X factor, that intangible quality that's just because it's so natural and innate to them, that they can develop it to a much a much superior degree than at a simple awareness. Now, when we look at mediumship in that way, what we begin then to see is that all the experiences that we have develop that quality to a degree. They're either going to hinder that quality or help it to flourish, or in some cases, it's going to activate the potential itself. That potential that's there is going to bring it right to the surface. That's what happened with me. I had lots of different experiences growing up, but that experience that I had in Sheffield was a catalyst for change it really brought out that true mediumistic quality that I had. The problem, of course, then, is that that mediumistic quality was founded on insecurity and instability. I'd gone through a very difficult time, as I've been talking about. Some, some of your listeners, their mediumship might have come later on in life, to come to the surface later on in life, once they had lost somebody to the spirit world or had gone through a traumatic experience, perhaps. And of course, then, the mediumship is founded on instability. We've got to heal from that loss or that traumatic event, or in my case, Sheffield and that loss of everything that, that I went through. If we don't heal that part of us first and strengthen that part of us and, and accept it, our mediumship is always going to be founded in that, in that instability, of that emotional instability of the experience. The journey that I went on was to find stability in all my different aspects of life, which, you know, my very first mediumistic contact it was probably better than I've ever, well, probably one of the best contacts I've ever given because I'd strengthened and brought it all to the surface. It was just there to work with. Uh, last we knew in the story, you'd come back to Birmingham. And were you 18 or something like that? Around about that? Yeah. Yep. You come back to Birmingham and you were inspired in some way to go and visit the local Kings Heath Spiritualist Church. Yeah. So that was your own fruition. Nobody nobody sort of said, oh, there's a guy called such and such at the church or anything like that. You just decided, I'll go to a church. I just went to the Spiritualist Church to look at the building, just to see where it was. And when I got to the church, the doors were open and 
again, people were leaving their cars and walking in. So I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll go and I'll go and walk into this building too. Yeah. And this time when I when I walked in, there was a an elderly woman sitting at a table. I said, Well, what's going on here? Well, what's you know, what 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 happens here? And she said, Oh, well, it's our open circle tonight. You're more than welcome to join us. Okay. I went in and sat down. There was a circle of about 20 people. And um, the circle leader, Glennis Owen, I know it was, she invited us all to sit in meditation. So I did. I just did what I was what I've been practicing for the last two years or year and a half at this point. And after the, we spent about half an hour, she came over to me and said, you sat really well. Thank you. I've, I've been doing it for a while. I said, okay, you're going to make a contact now with the spirit world. I said, what's that? She goes, well, you're going to communicate with people that have passed away. I said, I don't know how to do it. How do I do it? She goes, well, you'll see in a minute. She asked me to stand up. This is my first ever experience, conscious experience with the spirit world. She said, okay, tell me what you're aware of. In that moment, I'm not sure really what happened. I can't tell you how I became aware of what I became aware of. It was so quick, but it was just almost this knowing. It was about, say, about 20 people in the circle. I went direct to this woman. And this was my first ever contact, no training. I said, um, I've got your nephew here from the spirit world. He passed in a car accident. It was a red Ford Fiesta. He left the road and hit a tree. She said, yeah. And I said, it's his birthday today. And she said, how do you know that? I said, well, there's a, there's a bay window in your front room and there's a table in the bay of the window. She said, yeah. I said, then there's a photograph of your nephew on that table. In my mind, I, I was aware of my grandfather's house. As I've said, in, in his bay window, he had a table there and he had a picture of my nan on that table. But I just, I knew it was his uh, her nephew rather than my grandmother. And um, she said, yeah. And I said, well, before you left today, you wished him happy birthday and you lit a candle next to the photograph and you come and left and come here. She broke down into tears. That was my first ever contact that I ever gave. Not bad. No, so it was, I mean, for, <laughs> for the first ever experience, I was very happy with it. And I, I think the spirit world, they know me, obviously. And in my life, I'll give something a go for a few weeks. And if I'm not good at it naturally, it's not something that I'm good at. If I'm struggling after a couple of months, I look for something else. I, I look for something that, I'm more, that I can pick up, you know. So I think the spirit world probably knew that and gave me a bit of a leg up for the first experience to kind of get me hooked. And then after that first day, I had the bug. You know, I was, was very passionate from that first moment. I saw the difference it made in that woman and the way it felt for me. And I've dedicated the rest of my life to my mediumship ever since that that first evening. Oh, well, I can absolutely understand that. The challenge is, of course, there's this perfectionist side of you that needs to get everything right and if you're not getting everything right, you're not happy with yourself. And, and I know that that's one of the problems a perfectionist has. So you seen this opportunity as something you could do. This is something that you could excel in in your life. And you then pursued the avenue of further education through the Arthur Finlay College, etc. How did that transpire? How did you get to go there first time? Yeah, I was going to Kings Heath Spiritualist Church for a few weeks only two or three weeks, maybe two weeks. And there was a college tutor that was coming to the church for a workshop. So I decided to attend. It was Paul Jacobs, the, the teacher. When I look back, some of my early experiences were, were really amazing. He put us in, into groups and I was working with this guy. I never met him before. Didn't recognize him. Didn't know who he was. And as I was doing the exercise, Paul came over to the, um, to the other side of the room and was listening. And I remember, I, I said to him, I remember this contact too. I, I said, I've got your dad here. He said, your dad's name's Tom. He said, yeah. So he was a carpenter. Yeah. I said, your name's Tom. He said, yeah, it is. I said, but you got a son and his name's Tom as well. He said, yeah. And I said, your son went to Bourneville Junior School. He was like, yeah, he did actually. It's like, he's my friend from school. I'm sure he, this is your son, Tom. I can't remember the life of me now, the surname. But what, that wasn't medium mystic. I just recognized it was my friend's dad. But in the moment that I didn't know it was his dad until... I became aware of it, you know. So Paul was listening to all of this. And and then, then his, this guy's wife came and she communicated. It's a long time ago now. It's nearly 20 years ago. I don't remember that communication, but I remember the name thing. After the class, Paul was there for, I don't know, two or three hours. He invited me to go to the college. He said, don't you know, I think something potential there. Would you come to the Arthur Finley College? And I said, oh, I don't know what that is. He said, well, it's a place where you can learn. I said, oh, okay. So I went and booked on, a, on the course. Yeah, he invited me on. I didn't hear from Paul after that. I remember turning up at the college thinking, oh, I wonder if Paul will remember me. You know, he said he wanted me to be in his group. I'm not sure if he'll remember me now. You know, when I got there, he recognised me and put me in his group and we 
And I said to him, oh, I haven't heard from you. He says, oh, no, I've, I lost your contact details. Couldn't find them. But I'm glad you're here. And I put you in my group and we had a week together. It was a fantastic week. It was, it was Glenn Edwards this week. Paul was the tutor on that week. Life-changing week for me. Paul came downstairs. He, he, it was the last day he'd gone up to pack his belongings. And he came down and said, um, would you allow me to mentor you? He said, the weird thing was I'd, I lost your uh, contact details. But when I went upstairs to pack my bag, your name and number was lying on top of my clothes. I'm not sure how he got there. So I said, well, yeah. So I told me that story. I said, I agreed to, to be mentored by him. And, and that was it. And then my formal education really was 18 months from the first that first week at the college to my first public demonstration was about 18 months. And I used to go to different seminars that Paul was um, taking. And uh, that was it, really. Can you tell us what um, CSNU qualifications you've now got? I'm a certificate holder of the Spiritualist National Union, which I, I think I must have gained that qualification in about 10, 12 years ago. And really, it's the certificate is you're assessed by both a, a district board, a local board of examiners and a national board of examiners. They examine your ability to demonstrate, your ability to speak, um, public speaking. So I achieved that. And then I went on to then become a, a tutor, uh, do my tutor training at the Arthur Finney College. I'm, I'm now a, a tutor and course organiser there. I've been for quite a few years now. And so really, yeah, it came full circle. I, I began my very serious development at the Arthur Finney College. And now I, I try my best to um, encourage others on this with their serious development at the Arthur Finney College. So it's, a, it's an honour to, to be part of, that, part of that establishment. Do you think the education has improved dramatically your mediumship altogether? I don't. I, I don't really think my education has necessarily improved my demonstrations of mediumship or my private sittings, my, the actual expression of my mediumship. I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily improved that. What, what I do think, though, is that what my training in philosophy has, has done is, is that philosophy is it's actually about asking the right questions. That's what a philosopher does, is that we look at a problem or an idea. We're trying to ask the right type of questions that are going to lead us to a good answer or an understanding of that topic. And I think what that training has allowed me to do in my education, really, is it, it's, it has enriched my teaching and it's given me lots of different worldviews and frameworks in which to break down the philosophy of spiritualism, the philosophy of mediumship, how mediumship works. Um, and, I, and I add lots of different components of, for my university education into my theoretical teaching of mediumship. I did a lot of work. I, I actually wrote a paper for the Society of Religion on mediumship as a mystical experience. And I, I did a lot of, of research into mysticism and it helped me to start to what we call a, a feminology which is uh, the nature of an experience began to help me understand the nature of the mediumistic experience and to describe it in by using for instance William James's ideas about mysticism and it gave me a, a real understanding of the, the type of experience that we're actually having as mediums it allowed me to explore that the nature of the experiences itself and there's some quite interesting things that come from that once you begin to understand mediumship in that way and that then has informed the way that I, the sort of exercises that I do for students, the way that I, I train them. It's definitely helped the teaching and more so than the actual expression of the mediumship itself. Andy, you've had a, we've all had a very, very bad year with the COVID 2020. We're talking now in 2021 and we've got the whole year planned ahead of us here. Have you? What have you got going on? I just, just should interrupt that and say, Andy, you were ahead of the game anyway with the COVID thing. You already were teaching online. You already had courses. You were already aware of all that. Is that going to continue in 2021? This year, the main body of my work will be online. And of, of course, I have been doing online work for the last three or four years. With people with COVID and people not being, con either restrictions that have been placed at the moment, people also have the confidence. I think next year, 2022, I think may be the start of a return back to in-person training for most people. I'll always do an element of online training. I, I enjoy it. I think it opens opportunities to some students that can't travel and can't get to physical places. Whether, especially now I'm in Canada, it means that I can still reach my students in the UK and in, in Europe. But I'll also will be moving back towards the in-person training too. There's something special about being with people mm. and uh, creating that power in the real moment. 
So I think there will always be a place for online learning, but I think equally there'll always be a place for in-person training. And I think it's about getting that balance right for different people with different needs. And what have you got in the Arthur Finley College uh, 2021? I, 2021, I haven't got anything booked in for the college in 2021. At the moment, I'm unable to travel because I'm in Canada. Um, I'm hoping to be back at the college uh, in 2022. So you keep an eye on the list of students that are coming because if you find I'm on that list, you want to cancel because I'll be following <laughs> you around. I'll be asking you questions and you're like, for goodness sake, who let him in on this course? <laughs> Brilliant. And, and the, I, don't, I don't get to see the, the student list until the day of the course, so you'll be, you'll be safe. <laughs> Listen, we've we've got to wrap this up. You've given me a, an amazing amount of time today. I should say you're coming back to do a pod class for us. Uh, do, do you want to tell our listeners what to expect? Yeah, I'm going to do a, a podcast on s- sitting in the power. What I'll be doing in that in that lecture is I'll be I'll be breaking down the practice itself, the manageable chunks, and giving you different practices and and an understanding of each aspect component that makes up the singing the power practice oh wow so i look forward to seeing you there well i can't wait and and you know there's a lot of people say yeah but he records it straight after the interview so he shouldn't be saying he's getting excited in this occasion on this occasion andy is coming back to do this another day i really cannot wait for it because that to me is the cornerstone of everything we do andy it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today on spirit to talk and i really am very excited with what you've shared with us have you got a very brief short message you could leave our listeners today the overarching message i very much believe of spiritism can be summed up in the words of Nietzsche that i've quoted before which is every man who has a as a why in life can cope with almost any how with spiritism and with your mediumship it's all about really looking at who you are and what life you could have and of course we just started a new year in January and it's a time when we often begin to look forward to the future and the year to come and we start to take stock of the year we've just had in what has been a very difficult year for many of us in 2020 and what the new year can begin to provide and new goals new new desires new attainments and what I would really encourage all of all of us to be doing at this at this time of the year now is to look ahead but not to look ahead without first of all looking within the best New Year's resolution I think we can all have is very much about just spending a few minutes each day, so half an hour would be ideal, just starting to build that relationship with who we are as people and getting to know ourselves. And over the next few months and, and the next 12 months is really getting to understand what it is that you need within your life. The difference between the things that you need and the things that we want, understanding the true qualities that we possess and matching those with our needs, and beginning to find the true expression of our own soul. Sometimes it sounds so out of reach, you know, something that's so intangible that we think it's impossible to do. But actually, once you start to allow yourself to go into that practice, and you begin to allow yourself to go on that journey, there isn't a defining moment when you wake up and say, this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to be. It's a very slow process for many years, we just find ourselves in the right place because it can be subconsciously, it can be very in a very subtle way. We begin to allow our soul, the true us, the power of who we are, we begin to trust and allow it to influence and follow that, that need of that power. And we end up then living a life that's very meaningful and rich. It's not going to be a defining moment. It just unfolds. Our life unfolds. If we can stay in touch with that power and allow it to be a part of our daily life, whether that's the power of the spirit world too, the power of our own soul, I I very much believe that all of us can not only find the true potential of who we are, that, that true calling, that vocation, that expression that needs to be expressed, but we're able to fulfill it to the highest degree that we can, and that's possible in this life. For me, that is the meaning of life, and it's also, I, I hope, a message that can give you some meaning this year as we begin to move forward into 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Bring, thank you. Thank you. And that brings another episode of Spirited Talk to a close. A reminder that there are many ways you can support these podcasts into the future. Start right now by subscribing to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on right now. You are also welcome to join our Facebook podcast community group where hundreds of listeners and the guests come together to be part of Spirited Talk. 
If you'd like to contribute financially from as little as £5 per month, you can become a partner and access exclusive content and know that you're helping to keep this valuable information source going into the future. You can find out more about this and much more on our website at spiritedtalkpodcast.com. A huge thank you to my partners and to my guests today. From me, Trevor, thank you again and goodbye.